We are continuing our Forgotten Virtues series. I don't know about you, but I have really enjoyed this series. Just a precious reminder of what we believe, what we stand on, and why. And today we're touching on integrity, which is such a hard thing in the culture we live in, right? A culture that sees way more gray than black and white. In two national surveys conducted by Barna Research, one among adults and one among teenagers, people were asked, do you believe there are moral absolutes that are unchanging, or do you believe moral truth is relative to the circumstances? By a three to one ma margin, so 64% versus 22%, adults said truth is always relative to the person and their situation. The perspective was even more lopsided among teenagers, 83% of whom said truth always depends on the circumstances. And only 6% of teenagers said moral truth is absolute. And so this is the problem. We live in a world where integrity is kind of a moving target, right? And so let's look at just a, a widely held belief that lying is wrong right? We all believe that. You don't have to be a Christian to believe that. The world would say, lying is wrong. Mr. Rogers taught us that, right? We're not supposed to tell lies. But what this survey tells us is that we don't really think lying is wrong. We think lying is mostly wrong. But for the right reason and the right set of circumstances, 66% of adults and 83% of teenagers would say it's perfectly okay to lie as long as you have a good enough reason. Now apply that to every moral truth. It's perfectly okay to fill in the blank with any moral truth, any absolute, any, any commandment from the word of God. So stealing, right, is absolutely wrong to steal unless you have a really good reason. That's what the, the moving target of integrity looks like. So in a world that surrounds us with that gray area, we as Christians are still supposed to live a life of integrity, but how? The simplest definition of integrity is when your behavior matches your beliefs. Integrity is when your behavior matches your beliefs. We are known as Christians or believers, right? So we have these, these deeply held beliefs about who God is, who his son is, what that means for our lives. And part of that is a moral compass that we cling to and say, because the word says this, we believe it. And our behavior lines up with that when we have integrity. So really what, what we're looking at today is how do we make sure that our beliefs precede our behavior and not our feelings preceding our behavior? Because what I believe to be true should be unchanging. But what I feel to be true depends on the circumstances. So how do we become a people who allow our actions to flow from our beliefs and not what we're feeling in a moment? So we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 12. One of the greatest examples of integrity in scripture. And obviously the Bible is full of godly men and women. So lots of great examples of integrity. But let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 12. We're going to start right at verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 12, this is his farewell speech, right? 1 Samuel chapter 12, starting at verse 1. Samuel said to all Israel, I have listened to everything you said to me and have set a king over you. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I am old and gray and my sons are here with you. I have been your leader from my youth until this day. Here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have, ex have I accepted a bribe to make me shut my eyes? If I have done any of these things, I will make it right. You have not cheated or oppressed us, they replied. You have not taken anything from anyone's hand. Samuel said to them, the Lord is witness against you and also his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. He is witness, they said. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. We want to hear your voice loudly. Lord, I pray that you guard our hearts against distraction and confusion and that in the next few minutes that your word is living and active and brings new life into this house. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So this is his farewell speech. What a way to live, to be able to make a farewell speech like that, to say, hey, if I've ever done anything wrong, here's your chance. So let's look at what we can get from the life of Samuel all tied up in this speech. First, integrity chooses others over self. Integrity chooses others over self. Samuel begins his speech with, I've listened to everything you said to me, and I've set a king over you. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me... I am old and gray. In the chapter right before this, in 1 Samuel 11, we see Saul as a new king defeats the Ammonites in battle. And what Samuel sees here is now that Saul had this great victory, the nation is ready to look to this king for leadership. Now we see prior to that, there's always this push and pull, right, in the Old Testament of whether or not we should obey God or have a king. And this was a moment where Samuel could have drawn the line in the sand. You're all going to look to him, but you're wrong. You're all going to look to that king, but he is not really the one you should still be coming to me. But instead, Samuel chose what was best for the nation. He helped them make that transition. He says, I am old and gray. Here's your king. He helped them make that transition because he chose others over himself. He didn't grasp at his own desires. He didn't grasp at his own position. He didn't grasp at what he thought was best. Instead, he said, for this nation to stay unified, for these people to stay together, I need to step aside. I am old and gray. He didn't do it at a time when Saul was at his lowest. He waits till after a major victory. The the whole country is rejoicing in this victory. And then he says, now's my chance. I am old and gray. This is my farewell speech. He decided to prefer what was best for others over himself. You know, often it's the mindset of looking out for number one that causes people to compromise their integrity, right? When we feel entitled to something, that word, you're not going to see it in Scripture, We're not entitled, but when we feel entitled, when we say, you know, I've worked so long at this job, I deserve a promotion. I'm such a good husband, wife, son, daughter, fill in the blank. I deserve to be treated better than this. I am entitled. I deserve recognition. Don't they know how hard I worked? I deserve it. I'm entitled to it. And when I don't get it rightfully, I'm okay with getting it wrongfully because after all, I am entitled to it. And what happens so often is that this becomes a cycle where uh, even believing people feel entitled to something, right? I've served, I have served in this position for years. How dare they pick someone else to lead, right? Come on. I've worked at this company for 20 years. Why would they hire someone from the outside? I've been the best student in the classroom, Why does the teacher prefer her? We feel entitled. And then what happens when what we think is supposed to be ours isn't ours, and we start to feel like this is supposed to be mine, this is rightfully mine, we go about, you know what? If I could turn people's hearts, this is what Samuel could have done. Hear this. Samuel could have said, if I could turn people's hearts from Saul, then they'll follow me. So he could have called people. Hey, you know... I know Saul just defeated the Ammonites, but you know what I heard he did before? He could have gathered his little crew, right? He could have sowed seeds of dissension, and he could have contained Saul and his authority, and Samuel could have promoted himself, and he could have said, but it was rightfully mine anyway. He chose others over himself. Years ago, when I was a a teenager, I was a waitress. And I worked at a restaurant, not a particularly fancy one, and they gave us a really deep discount on food. And the way that the the pay scale worked for us waitresses was we made a whopping $2.15 an hour. (laughs) I don't know what it is now, but that's what it was then. And then we would add our tips to it. And once we were making over minimum wage, we'd be taxed on that or whatever. And I didn't really understand the system, but I knew that one benefit we had as a waitress was that we got a deep discount on the food at this particular restaurant. So 
When we were going to take our break a few minutes before, we would ring into the register what we wanted. The ticket would go back to the kitchen. We would type employee meal, and then the discount would come up, and we would pay. So I always, almost always worked with this same gal. And I really honestly thought for a long time that she was the world's worst waitress. Like, it's not really that hard of a job, and you have to try to be that bad at it. But she would continually mess up people's orders. And so the person, you know, at table three would want a cheeseburger with ketchup and pickles, and she would ring it up as mustard and onion. And this happened almost every shift. She was messing up someone's meal and, oh, I'm sorry, I ring that in wrong. Will you fix it? And then several months in, I discovered this. If you ring up a meal wrong and they make it, then you could just eat it. They don't throw it out, and you don't have to be charged for an employee meal. So she tells me this, and I was like, you're stealing the cheeseburgers. I was so, you know, I was a teenager, so I was still really, like, new in the workforce. But I was like, wait, so what you're telling me is the rule is that we're supposed to ring it in. And I mean pay, like, like if the sandwich, you know, grilled cheese was $2, we paid, like, 50 cents. I mean, it was, like, nothing. So you're ringing in these meals knowing that that's what you want. And so without fail, we'd be working, and she'd say, I really feel like a chocolate milkshake, and here would come a a chocolate milkshake. Oh, whoops, that was supposed to be strawberry. Oh, well. And I would see her do this time and time again, and this is what I would think. You are selling your soul for a decent cheeseburger. (laughs) What? She wasn't a, a Christian, but still, what is the price of our integrity? But here's what happened when she told me how we could do this. She said, Remember, they only pay us two fifteen an hour. You know how much the manager makes? Do you know how much the guy in the kitchen makes? We're the one doing all the work. We're the reason the customers are coming through the door, and they're ripping us off. Do you know the manager gets to eat for free? Well, probably because he doesn't steal food. I didn't say that. But here's the thing. She felt entitled. How dare they rip me off at this job I agreed to work at? <laughs> how dare they rip me off? And because they are... And I really, I mean, they should be giving us free food. I can't get it rightfully. I'll go about it wrongfully. We have to guard our hearts, friends, against any feeling of entitlement because that becomes a way that the enemy can weasel in and start to have us compromise our integrity. When you start a phrase with, I deserve, they should, I'm entitled, I don't know why they're overlooking me, fill in the blank. When we start to defend what we think we are entitled to, it becomes shaky ground that the enemy can come in and say, really, you are entitled to that. And you know what? You could get it if you went about it like this. But I can tell you that any, any victory gained through a backdoor compromise of integrity will not be kept long. Will not be kept long. Integrity chooses others over self. So that's what Samuel starts his speech out. I have listened to everything you said to me, and I've set a king over you. That's the first sentence of his farewell speech. Next, he says this. My sons are here with you. I have been your leader from my youth until this day. This is a tough one. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, Samuel is challenged to take his sons out of leadership because they were not godly men. And so that would have been a really difficult thing, right? Man, it's hard to make leadership decisions. It's really hard when it's your own kids, when it's people that you love, when it's people that you've known. That would have been really difficult for him. And when he says, my sons are here with you, That's often thought of as biblical evidence that he did that very thing because his sons would have been on the platform with him. But now instead, they're in the crowd with the people. My sons are here with you. Integrity is willing to choose what is hard over what is easy. It sees the long-term reward instead of the instant gratification. Sometimes doing that, friends, means less people in your circle. Sometimes making a decision To protect your integrity means less people. Samuel had to make a really hard decision. These sons, that that was not his dream for them. But they were going on a different path. And for Samuel to remain the leader of integrity that he was known to be, he had to make a really hard decision. Can I tell you that leadership always involves making hard decisions? And maybe you think, I'm not a leader. Sure you are. If you're a father, raise your hand if you're a dad. Like every man in this room, pretty much, then you're a leader. Raise your hand if you're a mom. Then you're a leader, right? 
you have a job, you're a leader there, even if you're not the boss. Because you're a believer, because the Spirit of God rests on you and in you, people are looking to you to see your response. You are a leader, and leaders make hard decisions. If you have integrity, that's everything. If you don't have integrity, that's everything. Right? When you do the right thing, that's all that matters. When you don't do the right thing, that's all that matters. Think about hiring a contractor to work on your home. Right? They're going to come and they're going to do the roof. Super nice guy. Really reliable. Only the thing is, every now and then, what's the thing that goes under the shingle? Sheeting, sheathing or sheeting? Sheathing. Every now and then you need new sheathing, but he just covers it up. Who cares? It's not like you're going to live there that long. Would you hire that guy? No way, right? Because you don't want a contractor that cuts corners. You don't want somebody that's going to come in your house and mostly do a good job, but kind of forget important pieces. Years ago, we were a part of a church and they were remodeling and this is a church that had been around for a long time. And so at one point they had built classrooms and then they were reconfiguring the classroom layout. And I made the comment, oh, I'm glad we're putting up new walls because it's always freezing back there. Naturally, those are the classrooms that I normally worked in. And I would say, it's so cold. On a cold day, it's like you're just sitting outside. I don't know what happened when they built it the first time, but they did not use good insulation. And the person in charge of the project laughed and said, you want to know what they used for insulation? Newspapers, sweatshirts. People literally took off their t-shirts and put them in the wall. (laughs) There was no actual insulation. They used whatever they could grab, and that was it. And no wonder it was freezing, right? And so here's what happens. Easy way shortcuts and integrity cost you. In the same way anything in life, when you take that easy way shortcut, I'm just going to skip that. I am infamous if I am involved in any kind of mechanical or repair. I am the quickest way from A to B. I do not care about shortcuts. Do not hire me to work in your house. But sometimes I'm like, you know, I'll Google it quick and try to fix something before Oscar gets home. And it generally doesn't really work and results in much more work at the end of the day because easy way shortcuts don't fix things. If I say to you, if you say, hey, my water heater's not working, and I say, well, let me Google it and come help you, don't agree to that because it's not going to fix it. That's the problem is so often in life we're looking for what's the easy way, right? What's, what's the quickest way to get what I need here? But integrity chooses what's hard over what's easy. Integrity is willing to take a stand, not just for an issue but for people. Samuel was willing to take a stand here, and he chose what is hard over what was easy. Next, next Samuel says, here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. That is a really bold statement. He's literally standing in front of Israel and saying, hey, everybody, everybody here, if there is any character flaw, if I've ever hurt you in any way, let me know now. Now, was he saying that so that he could counter? Oh, no, no, no. Listen, Natalie, you're saying I did that, but I didn't really do that. You're not telling the whole story. Nope. That's not why he was saying that. Not so he could counter. Not so he could accuse back. It says he said that because he wanted to fix it. Tell me if I have ever done anything wrong so I can make it right. What a brave statement. Can you imagine even just in your own family? Standing up on Christmas, maybe you have a really holy, perfect family, but if you don't, maybe you can't even imagine gathering everyone together and saying, hey, anybody in this room, if I've ever done anything that you didn't like, tell me now so I can fix it. Some families, that would take a really long time, (laughs) but family, coworkers, now imagine the entire city of Rhinebeck, the, the Rhinebeck, the whole state of Iowa, a place that you've lived your whole life, calling everyone together and saying, hey, if ever I've wronged you, I want to fix it. That's the boldest statement here in this whole speech that Samuel makes. And I can't imagine that somebody would ask that question if they had a lot to hide. If Samuel had lived a life of hidden sin, of hidden agendas, If Samuel had been known to have compromises in his integrity, I don't think the speech would have sounded like this. He could humbly ask that because the condition of his heart was pure. 
And you know what he's really saying is this. If I've hurt you, it wasn't intentional and I want to fix it. What he's really saying is I didn't knowingly compromise my integrity. But in the event that unknowingly I compromised my integrity. You know, I think that we have to be careful not to glorify. How do I put this? Um, Hey, if I've ever hurt you, I'm sorry. Listen, if you intentionally hurt somebody, they deserve more than that. This is an unintentional. This is if I don't know it. Now, if Samuel had stolen your donkey and you were in that crowd and he said, if I ever stole your donkey, how would that sound to you? A little tone deaf because you know he did. And you know he knows he did, he did it. So when, when we invite, hey, if I've ever hurt you, that's for the unintentional lapses of integrity. Intentional lapses where you have lied, hurt, stolen, whatever it is, those require a specific apology, not just a general speech. That was just a little extra. But here it is. Humbly knew he could ask that because he knew his heart was pure. There is nobody more troubled than someone trying to live a double life. Integrity brings peace. Duplicity brings anxiety. Integrity brings peace. Duplicity brings anxiety. There's a man known as Easy Eddie. Anyone ever heard of Easy Eddie? Easy Eddie? No? Well, this is where I would normally tell you a World War II story, but I've been banned from those for six months. Too many, I guess. World War II examples. So I found a different one. (laughs) Easy Eddie. Easy Eddie was Al Capone's lawyer. So as you probably know, Al Capone sort of owned the whole city of Chicago, right? And not by legal gain. Al Capone was really um, this hardened criminal. And Easy Eddie was his attorney. He was called Easy Eddie because it was very easy for him to find legal loopholes where Al Capone wouldn't have to pay the price for his crime. In return for his services, legal services, he lived this life of luxury. His estate was so big, it literally filled a, a city block in Chicago. And he later would say, it was easy to look the other way because of all of the benefits I had. There's only one problem with Easy Eddie. Easy Eddie had a son. And Easy Eddie really loved his son. And he wanted to pass something on to his son. And he said, there came a day when I realized there were two things that a person of integrity leaves to their kids. A good name and a good example. And I couldn't leave either to my son. So that was the day he went to the police, and he said, I'm ready to tell you the truth about Al Capone. And while that shifted how history remembers Easy Eddie, and certainly, I'm sure, shifted how his son remembered him, a year later, he was gunned down in a blaze of gunfire on a lonely Chicago street. His integrity cost him his life, but he was already paying that price. Duplicity brings anxiety. And sometimes it's not just these huge sins as Christians that we're taught to avoid, but smaller acts of compromise. Have you ever seen, ladies, I know you have, where someone is gossiping about someone else and then that person shows up? I've literally watched it in a restaurant where two women are just really trashing someone and then she shows up and this is how it goes. Oh, hi! (laughs) how are you so good to see you and everything in me in my booth I want to stand up and be like they're not your friends (laughs) they said this because here's the thing sooner or later you will be confronted with your duplicity that person that you've talked about you're going to be face to face with them right the things that you do that you think no one else sees hear me what you look at on the internet when you think oh it's normal everyone does this Sooner or later, you're confronted with your duplicity, if only in your own conscience. And you cannot have peace when you live a life of duplicity. Integrity brings peace. Any price you think you're paying for integrity pales in comparison to the price you pay without it. Even if nobody knows what you, but you. If we could bottle peace up, right? 
man, haven't pharmacists tried? <laughs> if we could bottle it up and put it in a pill and sell it and say, here's peace of mind, here's a clear conscience, we would be billionaires. Here's the ability to fall asleep at night without worrying about everyone finding out about your secret sin. But here's the beauty of it. You can. You don't live a life of secret sin. You quickly confess, make it right, and start over. And even like Easy Eddie, at the end of the road, it would have been so easy for him to say, but look at all I've done. How can I make it right? But his peace was worth it to start somewhere. You know, so often I think our points of compromise are in what we trust, right? When we trust ourselves, when we trust in ourselves to provide for our needs, when we trust in a job to provide for our needs, when we trust in a relationship to make us feel fulfilled, and then that thing fails us, whatever it is, it's where then we find that lack of integrity. You know, when when two people come together, like our, our daughter and soon-to-be son-in-law, when they come together in a marriage, there's this idea that you can't be two halves making a whole. You really have to be two whole people. And you pray that they really are two whole people when they come together. But when you start looking at your spouse and saying, it is your job, it is your responsibility to make sure that I always feel loved and valued because I watched a movie on Hallmark and that is what they said. It is your job to make sure. I mean... When I'm watching movies, those girls get flowers all the time and on and on, right? You feel this entitlement. It's your job. And then your spouse fails you. Hear me. That becomes a stronghold for the enemy to come in and say, maybe they don't love you as much as, you know, if they did, then they would do those things. And all those things that were provided for you on the cross feeling loved, feeling valuable, feeling worthwhile, knowing the price that God put on your head and how valuable you were, that doesn't matter because I'm looking for fulfillment in a relationship. And when my trust is in that and it fails me, and hear me, friends, whatever your trust is and outside of God and his perfect will, when that thing fails me, it will give me a reason to compromise my integrity and feel okay about it. But it's only because I trusted the wrong thing. You know, we lived in Hawaii. They had these helicopter tours all the time. Early on, one of the aunties there pulled me aside and said, Hoy, you and Oscar never go on a helicopter tour because they're run by Howleys, white people. She was telling me that, which is funny, but they're run by Howleys. And you can't, they don't care about anything but money. They'll take you up on a windy day. They crash all the time. Lots of people die on those. Never go on a helicopter tour. Now, the entire time we lived there, I don't recall ever hearing about a helicopter crash. But you know what? I trusted her. There was no way I was going up in a helicopter if the auntie who lived there her whole whole life told me not to. I trusted her because I knew she knew, and I knew she loved me. And I knew that she was looking out for us. And we just commented recently how many times there's been a helicopter crash in the news on our island. How many people have been lost even just this past year. And I said, how funny, that whole time we lived there, what if we had stayed a little longer? At what point would I have said, maybe auntie is wrong? You know, you can walk with God your whole life. You can follow his will your whole life, but then come to a point where you say, right now, it's not serving me. I know what his word says about relationships, but right now, it's really, really not serving me. And of course, I could get an exception to this rule. Of course, because fill in the blank. I know what God says about honoring leadership, but come on, have you seen my boss? Of course, I can get an exception right? Something that always bothered me when I would teach is the kids that would give you excuses with lots and lots of holes in them. Like, I couldn't get my homework done. Now they've had this assignment for a week. I couldn't get it done last night because last night I had to go to work with my mom. Okay, but the six nights before that, well, I was, I saved it till the last night. I thought I could do it then, right? There was always like holes in their excuses or like, hey, my, my internet crashed. Oh, did, have you heard of a library? <laughs> like it was just like there, there were holes in the reasons they couldn't get things done. But here's the thing. There was always this expectation. 
I know what it said. I know when it was due. I know what the expectation was, but you'll overlook that for me. Here's the thing about integrity. In order for it to be kept as the pure standard that it is, there can't be exceptions. You cannot say, I am a person of integrity in every relationship except this one. I honor my leaders except this one boss. I always tithe faithfully except when it's December. There's a lot of expenses. We can't live a life of integrity when we're willing to make exceptions every time it's difficult. Integrity is choosing what's hard over what's easy. And it brings peace and not anxiety. Now let me stop here and just say, because it needs to be said, there are lots of reasons that people are anxious. And it isn't always because there's hidden sin. We all know that. You all know that. But just in case you're somebody that says, I know my heart is right with God. I know my heart is right with people. And I still struggle with anxiety. I wanted to give you this disclaimer. Anxiety can be a really real thing, not linked at all to secret sin. However, if you have secret sin, you will for sure have anxiety. Now, you may not have secret sin and have anxiety, but I can promise you this. If you live a life of duplicity, you will have some anxiety with that. So that might be one cause, but it's not the only cause. And so if that's where you're at and you'd say, that's, that's, I struggle with anxiety, but that's not why. I hear you, I see you, and I know that. I do, I get it. But there's other reasons, right? So maybe your reason isn't that, and I wanted to make sure you didn't sit here and feel like, oh, that must be the reason. Search your heart. Let God search your heart. If you come up with that's not why, then that's not why. But I wanted to make sure that we handled that with a little bit of sensitivity, that sometimes anxiety is just coming from a totally different place than that. So this scripture ends with this. The people assuring Samuel, you had never cheated us. You've never oppressed us. You've never taken anything from our hands. What do we see here? Integrity is easier to keep than to rebuild. A long life of integrity can be undone in 10 minutes. It really can. Can you imagine if one of these folks stood up in this audience and they said, actually, yeah, Samuel, remember that time you came to my house in the middle of the night? And you took my oxen two towns over, and when you came back, I was missing a leg and an ear. Remember that time, Samuel? Can you imagine? Hey, remember that time on In the Loop when people were stealing donkeys and we found out it was you? Remember that? We know it was because we posted your picture and the whole town saw three times in case they missed the first post on In the Loop. Okay? So imagine then. That would have tainted his integrity forever. It would have been the end. Right? Nobody would have said, oh my gosh, Samuel, you're an oxen-stealing liar. But it's totally cool because you were really nice to me. It would have totally tainted their view of him as a leader in all areas. He protected his integrity because he knew it's easier to keep it than to rebuild it. You know, often those compromises, those those temptations to compromise your integrity, they're kind of like a timeshare demonstration. Has anyone ever been to one? Only us, nobody else. I was like, come on, you know you've been on vacation, you wanted the gift certificate, right? So that's what they do. We were, years ago, we checked into this hotel in Florida, and um, when you check in, we were there on a free trip. We'd won a trip, and We were there with my mother-in-law, my two kids. Oscar had been selected as like employee of the year for all of of Lutheran services of Indiana. And so they gave us this free trip. And there we are. And we're checking in to a timeshare resort. And they say, oh, I see that you're a guest here. Would you like to go to a timeshare demonstration? We're like, no. And they're like, oh, (laughs) but you can get free tickets to a resort. Pretty sure the resort was Gatorland where we later found out you just watch like alligators eat raw chicken all day, but whatever. It was like tickets to a free resort in Orlando. And so we were like, well, we really don't want to buy a timeshare. Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just come and hear about it. That's all we want is just for you to listen for one hour. Well, we did the math quick for all five of us to be able to go to that, you know, resort for the day. I I wouldn't call it that attraction. 
for the day would have cost way more than an hour's of work. So we're like, sure, we'll go. Mom will watch the kids. And so we show up, and right away, this guy starts like this. Wow, you guys are hard workers. Man, you deserve a vacation. Wow, how often do you get to vacation? Oh, about once a year. Oh my gosh, can you imagine? I mean, it was laying on thick. Like, can you imagine if you die young and you've only been on 20 vacations your whole life? Can you imagine how old are your kids, two and four? Oh my gosh, you're going to blink your eyes and they're going to be an adult. And what if they have no memories? What if they just have a sad, vacationless childhood? I mean, what? So they ask you all of this, and we know where it's going. It's going to end in a sales pitch for something we couldn't afford if we sold a kidney at that stage. We're like 23 years old. Like, we can't, uh, no, we're here because it was free. And so they're going on, and, and we're, you know, answering his questions. We're trying to be polite, but then you feel bad. Like, we're answering him the, the way that he wants us to, so he's getting more invested, and this probably ending well for him. So it's like, do you, do you love your children? Is it, what's more important to you, work or making memories with your kids? Well, making memories with their kids, good answer, good answer, Oscar. So it went kind of like that. And at some point, he finally gets to the end where he tells us what the timeshare costs. And at this point, we're almost just laughing. We're like, yeah, we can't afford it. No, you can't afford not to. No, like, <laughs> we really can't afford it. Is there going to be like a credit check? Because you will see we can't afford it. We're 23 years old. 23-year-olds don't get timeshares. <laughs> and so he's going on. And, and at some point, you realize this is kind of how the enemy works, right? He comes in and he tells you all the benefits. He tells you all the reasons the compromise is okay. He tells you all the reasons that the rules don't apply to you and you deserve and you're entitled and this time it would be okay. And he gives you all the reasons. And then once you said, you know what, that sounds pretty good. Let me just click yes. And the minute you do, you see the price. And it is never a fair trade. It is never, I can tell you, I have never sat with a Christian leader who's had a moral failure who says, it's totally worth it, I'm glad I did it. Never. In all the years that we have sat with Christian leaders who have fallen, every single time they are met with such regret and shame and remorse, and at no point do they say, I'm glad I fell like that. They always say, I wish I had seen how this was going to end at the beginning. But friends, we can Outside of God's will, we live a life of constantly rebuilding our integrity. But in God's will, you keep it intact. Your integrity should not be for sale for any price, not for a prettier wife or a stronger husband or a better job or more money or a different whatever situation in your life. Your integrity should not be for sale. It shouldn't be. Because the work of rebuilding it is going to be infinitely harder than keeping what you have. Now, the challenge in talking about integrity, and I kind of shared this with Oscar, is you kind of get this idea that it's all about doing. And so I've got to do X, Y, and Z, and I have to, you know, keep all the right actions in line so that I can have integrity. And you know what that is? That's like gasoline on the fire of a religious spirit. Like, oh, look at me. I have so much integrity. And that's the challenge is we want you to live lives of integrity, but we do not want you to have a religious spirit about it. And so as I prayed, I thought, oh, you know what? So did Jesus. Let's look at Matthew 23, verse 25 to 28. Matthew 23, 25 to 28. Jesus said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Can I just stop there? Don't you love how he makes a point like that? Your heart is full of greed and self-indulgence. In case you didn't get it, let me go on. He says, you are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Here's the real crux of integrity. It's not just doing the right things. It's doing them for the right reasons from a right heart. That's what makes us different. Because I can work with somebody 
who doesn't know the Lord, and they'll be honest. They'll show up on time. They'll never steal a dime from the company. But what motivates us is what sets us apart as believers. It's the why behind the right actions. And that's what Jesus is saying here. If you live a life of integrity on the outside, but inside your heart is full of greed and self-indulgence, what is it for? You've only fooled men. You haven't fooled God. But the beauty is that when you have cleaned the inside, the outside is clean too, right? But you can clean the outside and forget the inside. Integrity is so much not just about what we do, but about what we don't. And being able to find that line in your heart of, Lord, I want to honor you. I want to please you. I want to do what's right. But I don't want to just do it because I have to. I want to flow from a heart. Here's the difference. When I was younger, there was a season of my life, probably late adolescence, where I would pray that God would help me be nice to this particularly challenging young lady in my life. And so then when she would come around, I would say, we'll just give her a fake name because I think she might sometimes listen to this. So let's just call her um, Ashley. So she would come around and I would say, oh, hi, Ashley, how are you? And I would interact with her. And inside I would be thinking, you drive me crazy. I'm going to try to be nice to you. God's going to help me. God, help me be sweet. Help me be sweet. Help me not. And I would talk to Ashley as quick as I could, and then I'd run away. And and I would think to myself, wow, look how good I'm doing because she's super terrible. But I'm being so nice to her. My actions were right. Ashley would have never known. But in my heart, I had no love or kindness towards her. But as you grow and you're refined, you find that shift. And just because you're challenging doesn't mean I can't truly love you. Just because interactions with you are difficult doesn't mean I can't still truly be kind and want what's best for you. I can pray and intercede. And when I see you, it's not like, hi, Ashley. Oh, I can't stand her. It's like, hi, Ashley. Oh, yeah, I was praying for you this week. You see what I mean? That shift in your heart. So now the actions are coming from a place that's truly full of integrity and not just about doing what's right so that people can be fooled. And so today I'm going to ask if you would just to stand to your feet. And I think there are a few things that we need to allow the Holy Spirit to put his thumbprint on. The first is this, Lord, are there areas in my life that I'm unwillingly or unknowingly, better, better to say it like that, that I'm unknowingly compromising my integrity? Are there conversations? Are there situations? Are there things that are causing space between me and you? Because here's the thing, friends. When you are right with God and your heart is right there, your actions towards people will flow from that and he will set things right. So Lord, search my heart first. Are there areas of compromise that I don't know about? Where I might be hurting people are hurting my relationship with you, Lord, then I'm just unaware. That's the first thing. The second thing is, maybe you know. Maybe you're like, oh, I could skip that part because I know exactly the thing where I'm compromising my integrity. So then I would challenge you to spend this time in worship praying a bold prayer. The same one that Samuel said, if I'm doing it, let me fix it. If I've done it, let me make it right. That you would pray that prayer The same thing as he says, if I've done any of these things, I will make it right. Heavenly Father, let me make it right. If there's areas where I've compromised in some way. And then the last is this, to really begin to pray to be a person who goes beyond just the right actions to a right heart. Lord, shift my heart to look more like you. Lord, shift my heart to make me a man or a woman of God of integrity so that just like Easy Eddie said, I can leave behind a good name and a good example that the people of God of New Life Church would be known to be men and women who have not just a good name, but a good example, that we do what we say we'll do. And so I'm gonna invite the worship team, if they would, just to lead us in a song and you can stay in your seats. You can come pray at the altar. I'm gonna close this in prayer, but I wanna give you a chance to just hear the voice of your Heavenly Father about integrity.
You know, friends, we have to be open to the hard decisions that accompany living a life of integrity. And for some of you, that might look like going home and changing things right away. It might look like if you're struggling in a certain area, closing the door in the stronghold of whatever that looks like in your life. Just saying, I, I'm not going to have access to that relationship, that internet, whatever it is that's causing compromise. I'm not going to allow myself to continue one more minute on that path. Because friends, I can tell you that there is nothing not provided for in the cross at Calvary. There is no grace. There's no, there's no mercy that isn't for you. It's all yours. And it's for you. But we're not going to cheapen grace and mercy by looking at it and saying, I'm going to continue in my sin for as long as I can. We're going to encounter it and say, I don't want to be the same. And maybe if you say, I just want to make sure that I'm clean on the inside. I'm going to encourage you in this next week as you pray and as you fast to just continually allow the Holy Spirit to put his thumbprint on the things in your life that only you and he knows that are even the potential, even the potential of a compromise of integrity. Lord, show me where to build my fence up higher so that that thing can't touch us in our relationship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your endless mercy. God, I thank you that you love us, you forgive us, you restore us, that there's no shame or condemnation found at the foot of your cross. And Lord, I thank you that you don't just leave us to figure it out, but you empower us to live a life of righteousness, that the same spirit that raised you from the dead dwells in us, that there is nothing that we can't conquer, no weapon formed against your sons and daughters that will prosper. So Lord, we pray for integrity to rise up, that these will be men and women of God marked by holiness, marked by right lives with you, that Lord, we would never be a whitewashed tomb, a clean cup on the outside and dirty on the inside but you would search our hearts try us oh lord and if there's any unholiness in us reveal it so that we can make it right lord we want to stand before you someday and remember this moment where we shifted from who we were to who we are god we thank you for freedom we thank you for peace we thank you for the holy spirit that doesn't just convict, but empowers, emboldens us, and helps us live those lives of holiness that our hearts desire. God, we pray a blessing on your people as they leave today, that, Lord, we leave full of your presence. We leave fully committed to living lives of integrity, that, Lord, deep in our hearts, we'd say, when we have that, that's all that matters. There is nothing that our hearts hunger for more than you, and we thank you for meeting us there with all that you have for us. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.